Thank you very much, Dr. Harsh. He's had a long interest in matters of addressing faith in the public square. We're delighted to have you here this evening. You're going to enjoy a wonderful uh, selection of speakers. Among them is Dr. Russell Moore, who's the head of our Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, the Southern Baptist Convention. And you learn a lot about these things when you're in a minority setting. Here in New Orleans, Baptists have always been a minority. And it's when you learn how important something like religious liberty actually is. When you don't control everything, you understand why that matters so much. The great contribution of Southern Baptists to the world uh, is our uh, unique contribution. There are other people who preach Jesus, but Southern Baptists have been so committed to religious liberty through their years, and we are delighted that you're here to help us think through some of the very important issues connected with this. We hope and pray you'll have a wonderful time while you're here at NOBTS. If there's anything any of us can do when you see someone around uh, that works with our seminary, let me just ask, I know we have several of our faculty members here. If you just stand up, please, for just a moment. Let's identify these folks who are here. Any of these folks would be happy to address any questions uh, that you have while you're here. Thank you so very much. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and we will let the program begin to unfold. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you have done for us. We're so grateful for your patience, Father, for many of the lessons you want us to learn and live. We are slow to grasp, but even slower to incorporate into our lifestyle. Some of those, Father, are these deep issues of ethical conduct and religious liberty. So we thank you for your patience, Father, but we acknowledge, we understand it's not a good thing to be slow in grasping some of these lessons. And so we ask that you would take this conference and everything about it, that you would use it to instruct us, that you would use it to guide and direct, and that you would help all who participate in this to have not simply a better understanding of these very important issues, but a deeper, more passionate commitment to let them live, not live in words and lectures, but live in lifestyles and choices and decisions. We thank you for loving us before we ever loved you. Help us to take the love you've so freely given to us and share it with everybody around us, not only in the telling of the gospel, but in the living of our lives. This we pray in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The format for the evening is we will have our speakers come up. They will speak for uh, the 30-minute uh, allotment that they've got, and then we'll move to the next speaker. Uh, at the end, we'll have questions and answer time that you'll be able to direct a question, and uh, one of our speakers will answer it. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Matt Staver. He's uh, director of the Liberty Council as well as dean of the School of Law at Liberty University. Dr. Staver? Thank you, it's good to be here. This is my first time to the campus and I have enjoyed uh, seeing this campus and learning more about it. So it's a pleasure to be able to be here. And of course, I've known uh, Dr. Swain for a couple of years now and we just recently saw each other at a conference up in Washington, DC. So it's good to be here. Uh, I was asked to speak about uh, threats to counseling and those kinds of threats that impact our religious liberty. There's a couple of unique areas that we're facing today with regards to religious liberty. I'll focus on this one. But what we do at Liberty Council, Liberty Council is a public interest law firm. We have offices in Florida, Virginia, Washington, D.C., California, and a significant uh, outreach and presence in Israel as well. We are a public interest law firm that provides litigation, education, and policy to advance three areas, religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family. And we began in 1989. And the threats that we had in 1989 and the 1990s compared to the threats to religious freedom that we have now are night and day different. Uh, they are much more significant. They're much more complicated. Uh, they're much more aggressive. And we have a secularization that's taking place over those periods of time, particularly in the courts with respect to not necessarily being respectful to the rule of law, and a disintegration of the rule of law in the courts. So it's becoming more difficult to defend these, but we have a very high success rate. But nevertheless, we're seeing threats now that we never even thought we would see in 1989 or even the early 1990s. Two uh, particular threats that we've seen recently, one is with 
the Obamacare HHS mandate with regards to the forced funding of abortion on employers and also on individuals. That's a whole different topic that we could talk about. But I want to focus on impending threats to Christian counselors. The most significant threat that we're seeing across the country is the threat that is coming from the homosexual agenda. Whenever you redefine or attempt to redefine marriage, or whenever you take sexual orientation or any kind of behavior or identity now is what is the favorite term, so that it's no longer geared towards your being, but what you think, how you perceive, or how you want to express yourself. And you put that in a law to the same level as, say, for example, race. Uh, think about the context of race, what you can or cannot do, what you can and should not do. And you put uh, sexual identity into that same level, and it has a significant impact on religious freedom. And, for example, I was just in Washington, D.C. with regards to um, a conference I was there, Melissa, who has Melissa's Cakes. She can't bake cakes anymore in Oregon because of the fact that she refused to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. She doesn't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. In fact, she actually served this individual multiple times, baking cakes for her on multiple occasions, knowing uh, what she did and who she was. But when she came to her and said, I want to have you bake a cake for my same-sex ceremony, she said, I can't do that. I cannot participate in that. Or a wedding photographer in New Mexico said, I love doing weddings. I don't uh, determine whether or not somebody's sexual orientation is this or that. I cater and serve all people. But when I'm asked to do a same-sex ceremony wedding, I can't do it. And her analogy was, I don't discriminate against white people, but if you put on hoods and start burning crosses, I can't photograph a KKK rally. It would be contrary to my religious belief. And the courts there said, if you do not photograph the actual ceremony, notwithstanding the fact that you're not discriminating any other way, then you can't do photography. So you have to choose between doing photography or not doing photography. If you do photography, you have to do same-sex unions. And so she has to find a different kind of profession. What we're seeing in the counseling arena is the same kind of thing. And change therapy is uh, what is called or sometimes referred to as reparative therapy. Basically, it's just someone who comes to a counselor who is experiencing unwanted, and I emphasize the word unwanted, same-sex sexual attractions or engaging in unwanted same-sex sexual behavior or has unwanted same-sex uh, identity and uh, wants to change that, goes to a counselor. In California, SB 1172 applies to all of these different areas of counseling. Anyone who is a licensed counselor and anyone who works with a licensed counselor is under this law, SB 72, 1172. And it defines a sexual orientation at, or, or any attempt to change someone's sexual same-sex attractions as any practices by means of mental health providers that seek to change an individual's sexual orientation, this includes efforts to change behaviors or gender expressions, or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions or feelings towards individuals of the same sex. During the oral argument, we have a lawsuit against this, and also in New Jersey, a similar law was passed, and it is now being petitioned to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's our case. Those are the two states that have actually passed this law. A number of states have tried to do that. We've lobbied against those and have so far been successful in stopping other states from passing these laws. But what we have in California is the very first state to do so. Prohibiting a counselor from giving any kind of counsel to a counselee who's a minor with their parents under their informed consent and with their desire, any counsel that would seek to change or reduce or eliminate attractions, behavior, or identity. And if you engage in any kind of that counsel, it's now considered unethical practices and you could be disciplined and lose your license in California and now in New Jersey as well. What it does say, it says sexual orientation change efforts does not include psychotherapies that A, provide acceptance, support, and understanding of clients or the facilitation of clients coping social support and identity, exploration and development, including sexual orientation, neutral interventions, 
um, to prevent or address unlawful conduct or unsafe sexual practices, and B, does not seek to change sexual orientation. So a counselor can affirm a client who comes to that counsel to seek change and say that it's okay to have those attractions. Even though you don't like them, even though you want to change them, it's okay to have those attractions. But a counselor cannot counsel that individual about change or reducing the feelings, the behavior, or the identity. It says, under no circumstances shall a mental health provider engage in sexual orientation change efforts with a patient under 18 years of age. Now the California um, Association for Mental uh, Marriage uh, Therapists is producing a proposed ethical rule that will extend this to adults as well. So anyone who's licensed in California under that ethical code, if that ultimately passes, and it likely will because it's in the same state that stops this for anyone under 18, it will ultimately also result in uh, prohibiting that kind of counsel to adults. And you have to understand this. Someone might ask, does it apply to a pastor or someone in a church setting? It does if the pastor or whoever is in that church setting is a licensed counselor in California or in New Jersey. However, if the supposition is that this kind of counsel is harmful, which is what they argue, if it's harmful then for and prohibited for a professional licensed counselor to provide this kind of counsel, then it's an easy step to simply say the next step is then unlicensed, untrained individuals should not provide it as well. This is the uh, senator who introduced this into uh, law in California. He says the attack on parental rights is exactly the whole point of the bill because we don't want to let parents harm their children. Uh, SB uh, 1172 uh, was uh, called a, an, an unprecedented restriction on psychotherapy. This is what the California Secular Counseling Associations originally took the position of. And when they got ready to see that it was actually going to pass, they took a neutral position. But it is clearly an unprecedented intrusion into the counselor, counselee scenario where there is no precedent in history where the government has ever come into the counseling room and told the counselor and the client that you could only have one view of a particular subject. The subject matter is permissible, sexual orientation, sexual same-sex attraction, same-sex behavior, identity. All of that subject matter is permissible, but only from one viewpoint of that subject matter, that it's okay if you say anything to the contrary or help that client seek their objective to change or reduce, then it's an unethical uh, behavior under the California New Jersey Counseling Codes. It says, uh, New Jersey, uh, 3371, a person who is uh, licensed to provide professional counseling shall not engage in sexual orientation uh, change efforts with a person under 18 years of age. Goes through the same things, covers uh, all of the different licensed uh, counselors, and has the same uh, language. Sexual orientation change efforts means the practice of seeking to change a person's sexual orientation, and it goes on. It's exactly the same thing as California. Democratic governor signed it into law in California. Republican governor signed it into law in New Jersey. That was Chris Christie. This is uh, 3371, sexual orientation change effort shall not include counseling for a person seeking to transition from one gender to another. In other words, get this, a boy comes in, and this boy now says, uh, I think that I am identifying as a woman or a girl. The counselor can help that individual accept this, quote, transition in gender identity or expression from male to female, so can, in fact, help that person change their orientation. But if, for example, someone comes in and has these unwanted same-sex attractions to a person of the same gender and says, I don't want to act on those, I don't consider myself gay or lesbian, that counselor cannot help that individual. The basic bedrock of counseling is that the client has the right of what's called self-determination. They have a right to be able to come into the counsel of their choice and set their counseling objectives. And that counselor, by the ethical codes, should not override that client's objectives. 
that counselor, by virtue of the ethical codes, needs to help that client seek those objectives. If the counselor has a conflict, the counselor should refer that individual to somebody else. But here now in California, New Jersey, this client cannot set the objectives that the client seeks. These are not someone, these are not people coming to a counselor that want to be affirmed in their same-sex activity. That they just want the, the guilt to go away and they want to be affirmed, they embrace it. These are people who do not want it. And in fact, in California, we have not only uh, counselors that we represent, but we also have parents and their minor uh, children. We have two boys, they're 14 years of age. They have experienced unwanted same-sex attractions. They did not consider themselves to be homosexual. The relationships with their peers at school began to deteriorate. The relationship with mom and dad began to deteriorate. Uh, they began to have uh, self-worth problems, hated themselves, uh, did not know if they could come out of this kind of feeling, did not like what they were feeling, did not act yet on these attractions, but were having these internal conflicts. Eventually confided in their mom and dad, and uh, they talked to their son. They sought out a licensed professional. In fact, he's one of the uh, well-known licensed professionals, not only in the United States, but worldwide in California. They began getting counsel from this individual. The attractions began to diminish. The boy's self-esteem began to grow. The relationship with his friends at school began to be repaired. And the relationship with mom and dad was repaired as well. This boy no longer hates himself. He no longer thinks about committing suicide. But now this boy and this other one, very similar, and another one in New Jersey, very similar to that, cannot get this kind of counsel. After this law was changed, the counsel that they were getting that was helpful to them, that counsel can no longer be provided. Now, this family uh, is a Christian. Uh, in one case, the family is Roman Catholic. In the other case, there was an uh, evangelical. And in New, York, or New Jersey, it's the same way. The counselors that are involved are Christian as well. In fact, uh, uh, David Pruden in California, one of our counsels, uh, counselors that we represent, uh, was sexually molested as a young man. He developed unwanted same-sex sexual attractions, which is not unusual to happen when a young boy is sexually molested by another male. Uh, it is uh, something that is more frequent than not, where that young boy will begin to have these unwanted attractions and begin to want to act out against some other boy in the way in which he was abused. That's what happened to David Pruden. He did engage in same-sex activity. He didn't like it. He ultimately uh, sought counsel. He gave his life to the Lord, and he changed. And now he provides that kind of counsel to others. But he's in California now, and the law says he can't do that. Uh, Dr. King in New Jersey, same way. She developed unwanted same-sex sexual attractions after abuse when she was younger. Uh, she went to uh, counselors. They said, you just need to accept it. It's who you are. She didn't want to accept it. She ultimately went to a, a ministry, and there she gave her life to the Lord, and she hasn't had same-sex sexual attractions in 25-plus uh, years. She ultimately had complete change from those uh, unwanted feelings, and now she provides that kind of counsel along with other counsel to people who are engaged in stressors in their lives, not just in this area, but in other areas. But in this area, she could no longer even share her testimony about change, that change is possible to somebody who is in the same exact situation that she is. She comes from a Christian perspective. Many of these people that seek counsel come from a religious perspective, and what they are experiencing conflicts with their Christian values, and they want to align their life with their Christian values. They should have a right to do it, but in California and New Jersey, they can't. This just goes through the same exact language in the California law. This is what the New Jersey uh, assemblyman said when he sponsored the bill. What this does is prevent things that are harmful to people. If a parent were beating their child on a regular basis, we would step in and remove that child from the house. If you pay somebody to beat your child or abuse your child, what's the difference? He's equating parents providing this kind of counsel to a parent who beats their child. 
And so if parents do this, it is abuse, and they can take the child just as though that parent were beating that child. It's astounding that you see the worldview from these individuals who sponsored this law. Now, this is the APA Task Force of 2009. In California and New Jersey, they relied upon this American Psychological Association Task Force that was actually stacked uh, against anyone who had an opposing view. And in fact, they wouldn't let any uh, believers on that panel, and they said specifically, it con you know, Christian views on this conflict, quote, with our worldview, close quote. And they intentionally would not let any other uh, group of people on that panel. It was a small group of homosexual activists of about four or five people. But here's what they said in the report that came out with regards to this kind of counseling. They uh, said that they performed a systematic review of the peer-reviewed literature and found some evidence of both harm and benefits produced by uh, sexual orientation change effort for adults. They had no research at all on children. All the research was only on adults. Even they admitted that they found evidence of benefit. The harm that they said that they found was not anything that was documented. It was anecdotal. Somebody came uh, and said, I have more guilt feelings now than when I did before I had the counseling. So I'm worse than I was before. Well, if you judge any kind of counsel by that standard, that it's not going to cause more stress in someone's life, especially if someone stops the counsel before the counseling process and therapy has been completed because people drop out early and they may be told, you, st you should stop beating your wife. You should stop having, uh, you know, it, it, it's not good to have a, an adulterous affair while you're married. You think of what it does to your, to your spouse and the person drops out of counseling. They're going to have possibly more stress because someone just told them something that they don't want to hear. Moreover, in fact, if you look at other areas of counseling, like anorexia, bulimia, it's a very difficult area of counseling to have success in. If we judged those kinds of areas of counseling against how much success versus failure you have, then all counseling essentially would be banned. Here's what they also said. To date, the research has not fully addressed age, gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, culture, national origin, disability, language, and socioeconomic status in the populations of distressed individuals. Whoops. Uh, sexual um, <clears throat> minority adolescents, they say, are underrepresented in research on evidence-based approaches, and sexual orientation issues in children are virtually unexamined. This is what New Jersey and, and California relied upon, this report. None of the recent research meets the method methodological standards that permit conclusions regarding efficacy or safety. In fact, one of the most exhaustive pieces of research came out of a professor that was at Regent University and a professor from another university and uh, documented uh, change over a long period of time. They relegated that most recent research to a footnote. We conclude that there is a dearth of scientifically sound research on the safety of SOCH. Early and recent research studies provide no clear indication of the prevalence of harmful outcomes because no study to date of scientific rigor has been explicitly designed to do so. There is no research demonstrating that providing SOCH to children or adolescents has an impact on adult sexual orientation. The fact of the matter is that those who counsel in this area uh, Adolescents may experience same-sex sexual attractions, but more often than not, it spontaneously goes away without counseling intervention. Uh, it, it may be episodic, and it's cyclical, but it's not something long-term. Now, if you are counseling someone, think of with a counselor in this scenario. If you're counseling someone who without even counseling the intervent without even intervening in that counsel to change someone's sexual orientation and they're an adolescent and they're experiencing this and they're one of those individuals that would it, it would spontaneously disappear anyway and there's a lot of evidence for that would you be ultimately uh, charged with an unethical practice because you're counseling even though even though you didn't counsel change actually resulted in change because you're just helping this person um, have self-dignity and self-worth and self-respect 
and relationships with others? It says, given these limitations, the task force concluded that research on SOS uh, has not answered basic questions of whether it is safe or effective and for whom. Research into harm and safety is essential. Of the patients I oversaw, this is Dr. Nicholas Cummins. Dr. Cummins was one of the individuals who was responsible for the change in the APA code, I believe, uh, to actually declassify sexual orientation as a mental disorder. But he is a very well, uh, he's actually a past president of the APA. He's not somebody who's uh, conservative uh, advocating this issue, but he wrote an article in the op-ed in the New Jersey newspaper when New Jersey was considering passing the law before it did pass, and this is what he said. Of the patients I oversaw who sought to change their orientation, hundreds were successful, and he's a former president of the APA. He goes on to say, the role of psychotherapy and sexual orientation change efforts has been politicized. Gay and lesbian rights activists appear to be convincing the public that homosexuality is one identical uh, inherited characteristic. To my dismay, some of the organized mental health community seem to agree, including the American Psychological Association, though I don't believe that view is supported by scientific evidence. He goes on to say, but contending that all same-sex attractions is immutable, is a distortion of reality, attempting to characterize all sexual reorientation therapy as unethical, violates patient choice, and gives an outside party a veto power over, uh, veto over parents' goals for their own treatment, or patients' goals for their own treatment. A political agenda shouldn't prevent gays and lesbians who desire to change from making their own decisions. And then... Whatever the situation at an individual clinic, accusing professionals from across the country who provide treatment for fully informed persons seeking to change their sexual orientation, uh, perpetrating a fraud serves only to stigmatize the professional and shame the patient. So this is what's happening in those states, and it's a, a trend that's beginning to happen across the country. So what we're seeing in this agenda, although it speaks of tolerance, it is very intolerant against any opposing viewpoint. And one thing that threatens that political agenda is the fact that sexual orientation or same-sex attractions or behavior can change. The uh, fact is, when we look at this agenda uh, advancing across the country, and now with about half of the states that have had courts that have struck down marriage laws, they are still in existence because they're going up through the appeal process. And uh, possibly within a few weeks or certainly by sometime in early January, we'll have a decision from the Supreme Court as to which one or a group of cases the Supreme Court will take with a decision possibly as early as June of 2015 and certainly no later than the 2015-2016 term. And with this particular court, I have no confidence that this court will reach the right decision. If that happens and the marriage laws across the country from the Supreme Court are struck down, this is a cataclysmic game changer. It changes from every single aspect of our culture and the first target will be people of faith who disagree, who believe in biblical moral values that God created male and female, man and woman in his image, and that marriage is part of the natural created order. Marriage predates religion. It wasn't designed or created or invented by religion. It wasn't created by some governmental institution. It is part of the natural created order just as much as gravity is part of the natural created order. You can give a different name to gravity, but it's still gravity nonetheless. And by giving a different name, it doesn't change it. Marriage is the union of a man and a woman. It is part of the natural created existence. And to change that or to think that you can change it and pretend that there is no gender, because at the end of the day, this is literally an abolition of gender, that gender doesn't matter. As a policy matter, what this says, from a policy standpoint, if you go down this road, as a policy matter, it says that boys don't need moms and dads, that young man, you're dad or a dad, a father figure, is absolutely irrelevant to your life. Two moms are just as good as a mom and a dad. And young girl, uh, you don't need a mom or a dad 
just one of those is all you need for the rest of your life, and we will permanently deprive you by allowing this to happen from ever having the experience or opportunity of having a mom and a dad, opposite sex parents. And that will have significant impact not only to those children, just as an example from a cultural standpoint, aside from a religious liberty standpoint, girls who are raised in a mother-father relationship delay sexual activity until later in life. Girls that are raised in a single mother relationship uh, begin sexual activity earlier than a girl raised with a mom and a dad. Girls that are raised in a two-mother household begin sexual activity earlier than any of the other two categories and in a more risky behavior. And you can go on and on with all the different social issues that it will ultimately result in, but the first avenue of confrontation, which already has happened, is religious freedom. One outside of counseling is what happened in Massachusetts in 2004 when Massachusetts adopted same-sex marriage. Catholic Charities was involved in the adoption ministry, and they were told, now that we have same-sex marriage, you have to place homes in homes with moms and uh, with two moms or two dads. And they said that violates our religious belief. And they said, well, then you can no longer do adoptions. So they ceased doing adoptions in 2004, 2005. And that's happening in other states where this happens as well. These are people who are carrying on their religious mission. This is their God-given calling. These people are doing this because they, in fact, have experienced change or they know of change or this is their spiritual and, and religious uh, conviction, both as a counselor and as a client. And now, uh, for the first time in American history, a counselor and a client can no longer seek a specific or offer a specific viewpoint on this subject matter. So these cases are significant. They will continue to proliferate. I pray that the Supreme Court does take this case out of New Jersey and that it reverses it, uh, but it is the tip of the spear for counselors and what we're seeing happening in the counseling profession, I can guarantee you will come to the legal profession with the ethical licensing codes and every other profession as well. Thank you, it's uh, been a pleasure to, to be with you and uh, I look forward to the Q&A at the end and uh, good to join you, thank you. Good evening. Apparently, the Lord did not want you all to watch my video tonight. <laughs> but um, the reason I thought it was important, I believe it helps to explain who I am and why I've taken on the cause of religious liberty, first at Vanderbilt and now in a more broader way. And um, the, um, so I'm going to give you a little bit about my background, but I'd like to briefly open with prayer and then I'll get into that. So if you don't mind, I'll do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Almighty God, O oh precious Lord, for this place and for the people who have come out this evening. We pray, Almighty God, that you would bless each one, each speaker, Almighty God, that you would continue to um, lift this place up and the impact that it's having in the world. And I pray, Lord, that um, your will would be done this night through my presentation, that um, you would guide, you would direct, you'd give wisdom, and I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, first of all, I'd like uh, to thank uh, Dr. Harsh and, um, and Dr. Lemke and Dr. Kelly uh, for the invitation to speak. And I'm very honored to share the stage with such distinguished speakers as uh, Dr. Moore and uh, Dr. Matt Staver. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And when I think about those of you all in the community that are believers, that are out there in the trenches every day, and the administrators, the faculty members, the scripture came to my mind today as, as I was meditating, and it's Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust, uh, and w God is not unjust, and will not forget your work and the love you have shown for His name, as you have helped and continue to help His people. And I stand before you as a born again Baptocostal. <laughs> and it's been very interesting that uh, in the last couple of years, 
that God has really brought me close to Baptist. And I uh, had a late conversion experience that uh, happened between the time I was hired at Vanderbilt and when I actually arrived because I was hired in 1998. I went to Princeton, went to Yale in 1999 to get another degree and it was my fifth degree. And if you were able to watch this video, it would If you were able to watch the video, it would, it would have described the rural poverty that I grew up in in southwestern Virginia. I was one of 12. Uh, we lived in a shack. And the video, there's some photographs of the actual shack. The worst looking shack is the shack. And then the other was uh, a house that the people that put together this film found uh, for purposes of their artistic uh, whatever they do with films. And. Um, <laughs> That was Core Ridge Ministries that they co contacted me a few years ago, and they said they were tired of Star Parker. I mean, they didn't exactly say it that way. They said they were looking for a fresh story, and um, they got me to agree to let them do a video under the condition that I could not see it, I could not have any input until it was finished. And there's a woman that is, there's reenactments, there's a woman that's playing my mother that looks nothing like my mother. She, This lady is overweight and she's very stereotypical. My mother is thin and um, would be very upset if she ever knew about this video, but she doesn't know about this video. And so she'll never see this video if I have anything to do with it. But um, the video talks about um, just the, the desperate situation that I was in. I married at 16. By the time I was 20, I had uh, three uh, small children one died uh, of a crib death, and I ended up uh, getting a high school equivalency and then five college and university degrees. And um, part of the story talks about a medical doctor that I met after I'd done a suicide gesture. During that time, I would take bottles of pills and, um, and always being very careful to make sure I was rescued. And uh, it's something that you wouldn't want to try but it worked out that I was rescued each time. One of the medical doctors told me that I could do more with my life, and then I was working in a nursing home, and one of the orderlies said, you ought to go to college. And those words really changed my life. And then the film talks about me going to college, and then some of the things I've learned, and one of the things I've learned is, you know, that people really, um, people want to work, and people want opportunities. People want a shot at the American dream. They're not sitting around wanting people to hand them something. So that's part of the message of the six-minute video. If you want to watch it on your own time, uh, it's um, if you search under Carol Swain documentary, it turns up. So I um, did very well in college. Community college, uh, I met the dean's list a couple of times. But at the Roanoke College, the Lutheran School, I graduated magna cum laude. I won the highest prizes in the profession. I started the scholarship. And so I started getting a lot of recognition. Went to Virginia Tech. Professors pushed me towards uh, academia. I had no interest ever in being a university professor. It was the recession of the 80s. There were no jobs. <laughs> so I stayed in school. And uh, by the time I was graduating from um, getting my PhD, I was well known across the country, and, and this may be a tip for y the students that are in the audience. I mentored well, which meant that I paid attention to what the people that were experienced, the older people at the time, the people that had been successful in their professions, whatever they told me to do, I did. They said, you gotta give conference papers, I gave conference papers, uh, and I, uh, you need to come up with original ideas. You, you need to either build on someone else's research or come up with something original. I did whatever they said, and I was very successful at it. I ended up um, being hired at Princeton. I got, um, um, I, I ended up getting early tenure. I got the highest, uh, won the highest prize in my profession, the Woodrow Wilson Prize, and, uh, and most importantly, I got a signing bonus. And. Uh, <laughs> And so at that time, I was not, uh, I was not born again. Uh, 
And after I got tenure, the Lord put in motion the circumstances that led to my conversion. Now, the reason this story is important is that once I was born again, it was pretty clear to me that man did not place me where I was, that you don't come from that kind of poverty, go to a place like Princeton, win the awards I've won, and get tenure unless there's a supernatural being because I'm not a genius. In fact, I'm a political scientist because I, do, I could not do math. <laughs> and uh, so I knew that you know God was behind it. And when I had my conversion exper experience, God took away a lifelong fear of public speaking. And so he impressed on me that I had a message that was bigger than me. And so when I arrived on the campus of Vanderbilt in 2000, I came born again, and I came. I was very much, you know, involved in listening to what the Lord was trying to do in my life. I thought he was calling me into the ministry, and I kept waiting for him to spring me from academia. And that never happened. And, um, and you know, looking back at what has happened at Vanderbilt, Looking back in my life, I believe God credentialed me, positioned me so that I can go into places and so that I could be there as a full professor, you know, having the independence that comes with being a full professor. And what Vanderbilt did in um, 2011 is that they removed uh, protections that Christian students had had, uh, that, stu that religious groups were um, sort of exempted you know, from some of what they would call the dis anti-discrimination regulations. So they removed those protections, first from the students and then uh, from the faculty members. And they uh, had a statement that a student organization, they would have to sign these um, statements if they wanted to be an active group on campus. And the statements pretty much, um, the, the state, according to the new policy, students could not um, have faith statements. They could not require leaders to share their beliefs. And so if you were the Catholic, Vandy Catholic, you could not require that the leaders of Vandy Catholic be Catholic. And for the Christian Legal Society, they had scriptures in their constitution. The university said, you can't have scriptures in your constitution. So th I was the faculty advisor, the students were in charge, so we m removed the scriptures and still had some of the faith principles in the Constitution, but going back and forth, eventually we were told that you could not require anyone to affirm a belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So we have a email where they were told that you could not affirm a belief in, in uh, Jesus Christ. You could not require Christian leaders to lead Bible study or worship. And at that point, uh, there was a strategy that was developed, a solidarity strategy, where we believe that if we could get all the Christian groups to stand together, the university would, would you know, sort of retreat. And these groups would be able to stay on campus. But what happened was we couldn't get all the Christian groups to stand together. And so there were some groups that did not stand with us. And about 14 groups are no longer recognized on the Vanderbilt campus which means that uh, they're pretty much underground. They cannot use the email system. They cannot participate in the student fairs where you recruit new members. They um, can use rooms, but it's much more um, difficult. They, ha they can get a room if no one else wants the room. Sometimes it's like early in the morning, but that's difficult. But some of the things that they can't do that you would think if the university was really trying to even just recognize them as students that are paying student fees, they can't um, co-sponsor with another Christian group. So of the groups that are recognized on campus, like RUF, the groups like Crew, InterVarsity, Christian Legal Society, they cannot co-sponsor with a group that's on campus, and students cannot have Bible studies. If you're one of the groups that is, that's uh, not recognized on campus, you wouldn't be able to have an open Bible study in a dorm. And so that's something that we fought for a couple of years. We used the media, we used uh, protests, tried to contact trustees, everything humanly possible to try to get the university to retreat. The university did not retreat. And, uh, and some of the reasons that they didn't relates uh, to what Dr. Staver 
mentioned is that Vanderbilt is very sensitive because they were on the wrong side of the civil rights movement and they're not gonna make the same mistake twice. And you may have heard of Reverend Lawson, Reverend James Lawson, in the 1960s, he was a divinity student at Vanderbilt. He was involved in the civil rights movement and he was uh, suspended from school. And so in 2006, they brought Dr. Lawson back to, to campus and you know they almost deified him and so he gave all these lecture series and there were all these awards and, and so they were really doing abeyance to Dr. Lawson and the mistake that they had made. And I think that um, that was one factor in Vanderbilt going after the Christian groups. Another factor is the provost uh, has a son that's gay. He's no longer the provost, but he had a gay son and even though he was Catholic, he felt that gay people had been harmed by Christian people. And so that was a factor too, because he played an instrumental role in instituting the policy that resulted in the uh, Christian groups uh, being forced to leave campus. And um, the university saw an opportunity to distinguish Vanderbilt because Harvard had tried to do something very similar back in 2003 or something like that, and they had to back down. Every university um, before that that had tried something similar had to back down. And even now in the Ivy League schools, they're not restrictive as Vanderbilt. But Vanderbilt saw an, an opportunity to sort of make a bigger name for itself by doing something that a lot of schools wanted to do but were afraid to do. And I think they were able to get away with it because um, th there are some trustees that have enough money that they could make up for the money that was lost by the new policy. And where it stands now, by the province of God, I guess, I was on the uh, faculty council last year. And there's no way I get elected to the faculty council, but I was told that I was the runner up in 2012 and that the person who won the election wasn't able to serve. And so I was on the faculty council and I was able to, uh, near the end of the semester, we were asked to, if we had any issues, we wanted the faculty council to take up. So I proposed that we take up and review the religious freedom restriction and whether it had helped or harmed the campus, that type of thing. What I found was that most of my colleagues did not know anything about it. You know, they had vaguely heard something in the news, but if you were not Christian, if you were not involved, you really didn't know the details. And so they seemed very surprised. And uh, it ended with a promise that sometime this semester that they will invite people in, they will, will, review, they will review the policy and make a recommendation to the Faculty Senate to also review it. But what happened also was that I found out that some of the secular humanists, people that were totally indifferent were shocked because it was different from what they had heard and I saw a potential to form alliances with people that you would think would not necessarily be your ally but they were willing to, uh, to think about the policy in terms of what kind of institution are we and so there's a potential to get the um, policy reviewed. And so I don't know, you know what the future is, but I do know that across America, groups like InterVarsity, Christian Legal Society, Crew, are, are being de-recognized on campuses because they will not compromise their religious values and principles and sign the university statements that require them to accept leaders uh, that don't uh, uh, share their beliefs about a Christian worldview. Uh, a biblical worldview when it comes to lifestyle. And so that's the sticking point. And if the university, when it is honest, it's all about homosexuality. It's all about whether or not a homosexual leader can lead the Christian legal society. And basically the groups agreed that a, someone that has a same sex attraction can lead a Christian organization if they're celibate. And so that is not acceptable. And so that's sort of where it stands it's all about um, homosexuality. And with the Christian groups, any student at Vanderbilt can start an organization. 
and they can start their own organization. They can be the leader of their organization. And so it really isn't about giving students leadership opportunities. It's about a certain worldview that the university has decided this is our value. And they have decided in the process that the First Amendment, which private institutions don't have to adhere to, that the First Amendment's ideas about religious uh, freedom, that those are irrelevant. You know, it, it's okay uh, maybe if you worship in your closet, but it's not okay for you to be open on campus with your views and maybe teaching something that runs counter to what's, what the university wants to advance. And so what I see is that moving ahead on some campuses that um, Christian students have a real opportunity. They have an opportunity to go inside of any organization that they want to go inside of, seek leadership positions, and uh, evangelize. So for those of you all that are evangelists and for your children, don't send them to China. Send them to Vanderbilt. <laughs> But I mean, it opens up all kinds of opportunities. When the church was persecuted in Acts, I mean, the gospel spread. And I think that we uh, can use this to our advantage. And by the end of the day, they will wish that they had the old system. And so that's uh, what I see ahead is opportunities for new strategies. And I tell parents that come to me, Shall I, should I send my child to Vanderbilt? I said, yes, we need them at Vanderbilt. And so send your children, send them to Vanderbilt, let them evangelize, let them practice everything they're learning. So with that, she's done. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Harsh. I'd like to uh, call your attention to a passage of scripture to begin with in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, I'd like to start reading with verse 2 and read on down through verse 20. The scripture says this. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our fathers. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. You know, every time that I go into or pass the White House, I always think of a woman by the name of Loretta Lynn. Those of you who know the story of this uh, woman who came as Professor Swain was mentioning a few minutes ago, from a very impoverished uh, background. This was a woman who grew up in Butcher Holler, Kentucky. She was the daughter of a coal miner. 
Uh, she had a, a gift for singing and for songwriting, and she exploded out into the musical world in the 1960s. Her career started to take off very, very rapidly, and she was singing songs about her background and songs that, that seemed to resonate with people who knew the, the pressures of life in poverty. But she found herself invited to the Nixon White House. And walking into the White House, she had an audience with the President of the United States. And walking up to President Nixon, he said, it's so good to have you with us, Miss Lynn. And she said, it's very good to be here, Richard. Now, this created no small incident uh, in the White House, both with her handlers and also with the people in the White House who told her afterward, Miss Lynn, you cannot refer to the President of the United States as Richard. To which Loretta Lynn said, well, they called Jesus, Jesus, didn't they? <laughs> that tension right there is a tension that runs throughout all of American history. The tension between seeing a transcendent power, a power higher than the state, and also seeing the fact that we live in a society made up of people who believe in all sorts of different things. We recognize all different sorts of, of levels of power. So how do we live as people who believe the gospel among a people who often do not? And how do we live in a world where there is a church and there also is a state? Now, there are things that are happening right now in American culture that are going to make these conversations become more and more pronounced. I really don't think, though, that we're going to be going into some place that we've never been before. We're simply going to have the opportunity to have the same sorts of conversations and the same sort of witness that we had at a very different time in American life. And there are several different models that I want us to think about when it comes to the church. Now, the first model is the model of, of secularization. And there are many people who would see this as where history is going. Uh, the idea that the more advanced people become technologically, the more advanced people become in terms of education, the less religious they become. And so in this understanding, this simply means that as American culture advances, religion will become less and less of a factor until ultimately it's almost completely done away with. Uh, the problem with that is history. Uh, look around and one does not see religion diminishing in the world of any sort. One sees religion instead intensifying in some ways in good ways, in some ways in very bad ways. But an understanding of secularization that sees the role of the state or the role of the culture in advancing this along would simply see the church's role as moving out of the way as time goes on. But there are a couple of ways that, that we could respond to this. And one of those is a majoritarian understanding of religious liberty and of the relationship between the church and the state. And that is the idea that as evangelical Christians, we represent the mainstream of American society. And therefore, because there are more of us than there are of everyone else, then we ought to be the ones who set the rules uh, of the debate. Now, this idea starts really percolating in American life with great intensity in the 1960s. Uh, think about the, the sort of culture war that starts to emerge in the 1960s between the established order and uh, the counterculture. Now, it's a, it's a world that really can be seen musically. I mean, think of, the, think of the lyrics of some of the music coming out of the counterculture. Many of it, uh, many of them were, were very religious almost in terms of their uh, attempts to tap into the transcendent. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. There was this, this great moment that was taking place. Uh, think of uh, Bob Dylan's, The Times They Are Changing which speaks about this, this water that is coming through and sweeping uh, everyone aside. The old order is going away. And then think of the response that would come to that. Merle Haggard's Oki from Muskogee. We don't smoke marijuana in Muskogee. We don't burn our draft cards. This, this sort of response that is coming back said the counterculture doesn't really represent the real America. 
the real silent majority of America, group of people who share the same values, they have the same understanding of marriage, they have the same understanding of hard work, they have the same understanding of faith, they have the same understanding of the value of church going, they have the same understanding of patriotism, and the people who are challenging that are small groups of unaccountable elites, but they don't represent the real America. So the language that could be used in those conversations is, we represent the mainstream of people, and therefore, we are America. Now, there are some ways in which that's true, and there are some ways in which that's not true, some ways in which that's never been true, and some ways in which that's certainly not true now. But regardless of that, religious liberty is not a matter of who has the most people in the room at the time. Religious liberty is about something far deeper than that. Another temptation that we could often have that often goes along with majoritarianism is a civil religion that sees what is really important as faith defined generically. God defined generically. And so we start then to see religion and we start then to see faith in terms of what the faith can do for us, either as individuals or for us as a country. We need to be people of faith because if we're people of faith, that means that God is going to bless America or I need to be a person of faith because that means that God is going to bless me. Now, this sort of prosperity gospel, whether it applies to an individual or whether it applies to a nation, uh, has a, a very real problem with it. And the problem is that that is what J. Gresham Machen in the 1920s identified as liberalism. Now, regardless of what sort of uh, conservative garb it comes in, that is theologically liberalism. As Machen pointed out, the gospel can do many good things in terms of saving marriages and in terms of fighting back communism. But when the gospel becomes a means to an end of fighting communism or saving marriages or creating stable communities, the gospel now has become a tool to be used rather than what it is in Scripture, which is the central defining reality to which all people are called to give an account. Now, it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to hold to a majoritarian civil religion understanding of religious liberty anyway, even if they want of to. religion or faith or values or whatever people want to call it is increasingly controversial in American cultural life. And so the, the way that one could previously avoid getting into the specifics of religious controversy by simply talking about God is no longer possible. By talking about morality is no longer possible because even those claims, right down to the very definition of what marriage is or whether or not marriage is something that people ought to aspire to, is now being challenged. So how then do we as churches reclaim an emphasis upon religious liberty and prepare people for the next generation? I think the way that we do it must be not simply in terms of our own self-interest and our own self-protection. Now, keep in mind, self-interest and self-protection in this case is important. But that cannot be the central issue. Religious liberty matters ultimately because religious liberty is not simply a political issue. Religious liberty is not simply a social issue. Religious liberty is a gospel issue. As the future unfolds, there are fewer and fewer people in American life who are holding on to a nominal, almost gospel that sees Christianity or some sort of vague faith as being the ticket by which they enter the world of normal Americans. That is increasingly not the case, and I say good riddance to it. As nominal cultural Christianity starts to move off of the scene, 
those who are committed to Christianity are committed to Christianity, meaning explicit, theologically defined, missionally driven Christianity. We need to be the sort of people in our congregations and in our churches who are able to show people, all of the people in our congregations, why religious liberty matters for them, not just for activists, not just for attorneys, not just for politicians, but for all of the people of God, and we need to teach and train them why religious liberty matters not only for Christians, but for everybody, and that Christians ought to be the ones advocating and articulating religious liberty for everybody, not because we believe that all religious claims are equal, but precisely because we don't. And here's what I mean. There's several different things that we have to understand in preparing people for this. The first is the gospel. When I say that religious liberty is built upon our understanding of the gospel, the idea that is the central claim of Christianity, that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified for sinners, was raised from the dead, and that every human being gives an account at judgment. There is a reason why the early Baptists in the revolutionary era were so committed to religious liberty and not simply for themselves. John Leland, great Baptist preacher, would consistently, every time he talked about religious liberty, give a list of groups as examples of those that he wanted religious liberty for in the United States, including people who didn't really even exist in large numbers in in the colonies at that time, always mentioning the Turks, uh, the Muslims. Why is that the case? Because Leland understood that he did not want a group of religions coming to the United States government or to, uh, before that, uh, to, the, to the king of England and petitioning for favors as though the government had the power to bestow those favors. That was not because Leland thought that uh, the gospel was something that was everyone's finding his or her own truth. It's precisely because he and the other Baptists understood that a state cannot license a faith that saves. This was a point of agreement between Calvinists, who stressed the sovereignty of God, and Arminians, who stressed the responsibility and accountability of the the human person. They both agreed on this because both of them understood that if faith is not something that is happening apart from coercion, this is not faith at all. And they also understood that if people are going to stand before a judgment seat, then that means that every conscience must be free to deal with the claims that are coming to that conscience about the call to repentance and faith. We must fight for religious liberty for all people because if we have the sort of society where consciences can be paved over by state action, that not only treats human persons as things and objects of state power, that is also a danger and a repudiation to the gospel. That's true when It is being imposed by an anti-Christian government, and that is true if it is being imposed by a Christian government. A faith that can be handed down by a bureaucrat is not a faith at all. The gospel matters for this. The church is also significantly important here. Our understanding of what the church is The church is not an extension of the state, and the church is not simply a club of people who happen to share the same ideas. The church, biblically defined, is an embassy of the kingdom of God. The church, as we gather together, Hebrews chapter 12, we are joining ourselves to an already existing worship 
service that is going on in the heavenly places, and the church is proclaiming to the outside world what the kingdom of God will look like. When we say, for instance, that we believe in the separation of church and state, an idea that many conservative evangelicals, such as myself, have become very skittish and scared of, we should reclaim the language of separation of church and state. We were the ones who came up with it in the first place. Because what we mean by this is that there is a sword that God has given to Caesar, a responsibility of the civil arena to punish evildoers and to work for the common good. But that sword has limits. That power has limits. God has given a calling to the church to go forward with the word of God in persuasion and with conviction, but God has not given to the church the coercive power of the sword. We seek to see to it that the church is able to advance her mission free from government supervision, and because of that, we believe that every gathering of religious people are able to pursue their their uh, beliefs without government supervision and oversight precisely because of what we believe about the church and because we believe that that means that there is a limit upon the power of the state. Now this is a place where what we ought to be doing is spending time, as Professor Swain mentioned a few moments ago, working with our allies who do not see things the way that we see them religiously and theologically about why religious liberty is in the best interest of everybody, including people who believe nothing. Our Baptist forebears understood this very well. John Leland and Jeremiah Moore and those early Baptists did not receive Thomas Jefferson and James Madison at the communion table, nor would they have. They did not want Thomas Jefferson or James Madison's Bibles. Uh, What they wanted, though, was to be able to create an alliance to say religious liberty is in the interest of everybody, and let's work together to do that. So just as evangelical and Roman Catholic Christians often we'll find ourselves working with radical feminists on issues of combating pornography or sex trafficking because it degrades women. We need to be spending time with those in American culture who may not share our beliefs in order to say, do you really want a government powerful enough to pave over a conscience that believes that that conscience is going to have to give an account to a higher power? And if the government has the power to do that in every situation, then what on earth can the government not do? We need to be having those conversations and also to recognize and know that the real issue for us in our churches in cultivating religious liberty starts long before we get to the question of religious liberty. It means being able to articulate to the outside world what it means to be religiously motivated in the first place. I find as I'm working in religious liberty issues, when I'm talking uh, with people who are secular, people who are agnostic, people who are atheists, one of the things that typically happens is that many of these people, most of these people, are not somewhere in a lair plotting to destroy us. Instead, they don't really believe us when we say this is a matter of our consciences because many of them don't understand what it is like to be motivated by religion. They assume there must really be some other motivation that is there. Uh, I had a, a very secular person say to me during the Hobby Lobby case, just, just he and I talking after a, after a panel, he said, come on, what's the real deal? Well, what, what, are you, what are you really after here? Because in his experience, he assumed that what people are really motivated by would be money, financial gain, or political power. And he couldn't really see how 
this was benefiting the Green family unless they were extraordinarily bad business people to spend a year uh, involved in this court case over, over what would be a, a relatively a small fine in his definition. Why, what really is going on with the Little Sisters of the Poor when they don't want to sign this document authorizing the purchase of these abortion-causing drugs? We need to spend time articulating to the people on the outside what it means to really believe that we must give an account at judgment, and then also to spend time understanding why other people are motivated in the same way. Our response to religious liberty should not be immediately, how is this going to affect the First Baptist Church of Kenner, Louisiana? The first response we ought to say is, is this a matter of religious liberty, even if it is a conviction that I do not hold? Because if the government can come in and start to make decisions, saying, for instance, that that Muslim uh, prisoner has to shave his beard without giving a, a compelling reason why that's in the state's interest to do that, The power of the government now stands as a theological arbiter over a conscience. We should not ask, first of all, do I believe I ought to have a beard? Do I believe that it's wrong to pay for contraception? We ought to instead say, what is the value of a conscience before God? What does it mean to have a conscience that is free? And to be able to do that in such a way where we're making very clear that the end result here is not for us to get 51% of the votes so that we can mandate uh, church attendance and baptism by immersion uh, for everyone, but so that we have a genuine pluralism in the public square without a government-imposed theological definition. That's really what's at stake here. The question is whether or not we will have separation of church and state or a church and a state that is in union sometimes with a secularizing religion. There was an old Baptist leader who disagreed with me on just about everything, but I love the line he said when he said, everybody wants theocracy and everybody wants to be Theo. Uh, I think he was uh, quite right about that. And uh, that's what uh, we so often see with many of these incursions uh, in religious liberty. I was on a panel one time at a university campus with a Unitarian Universalist, a representative from the ACLU, a Muslim uh, scholar, and myself. We're talking about religious liberty issues. And I made the comment at one point, we ought to have the sort of freedom in the public square where she tries to persuade me that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet, and I seek to persuade her that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. College student stood up and said, that's so arrogant. Uh, why, Why on earth would you say something like that? Why are you trying to impose your religion on her? He said, you need to instead stand up and say, I worship God my way, she worships God her way. Why are you trying to impose your religion on her? I simply turned to her and said, do we worship the same God? And she said, tell me who your God is. I said, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit incarnate in the person of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. She said, not at all. So I simply turned to the student and said, why are you trying to impose your religion on us? Because in his understanding, it really didn't matter. These little quibbling issues of a trinity or an incarnation, that doesn't matter. All that really matters is what he believes matters, which is a generic God, something divine, some higher power. That's precisely what is happening here. The early Baptists in the Revolutionary Era were fighting against a government licensing, requiring licenses to preach. The answer that was always given from the government is, it's just a little amount of money. Just pay the money and sign the thing, and you're free to go. 
The early Baptist, though, said the issue isn't how much money it is. It's who has the authority to ask for it. You do not have the authority as the government to license or to delicense people to preach. That's exactly what's happening right now on uh, college campuses. That's exactly what's happening with many of our chaplains who are finding themselves in a situation in which many of them are being told, you can pray, but pray in your name. Don't pray in Jesus' name. Because as one commanding officer said to a chaplain, Just go ahead and say in your name, what does it matter anyway? The issue is not whether or not this chaplain prays in Jesus' name. It is that Caesar does not have the authority or the right to write or to censor or to plan out prayers. The government could easily say to a Roman Catholic chaplain, go ahead and serve the Eucharist to everybody. What difference does it make? It's just bread and wine. A Catholic chaplain who would do that is not a Roman Catholic chaplain. He's an Episcopalian. (laughs) We could wind up in a situation where we could have in chaplaincy chaplains of every denomination as long as they're mainline Episcopalians. We need to have the sort of pluralism where we have genuinely Muslim, Muslim chaplains and genuinely Mormon Latter-day Saint chaplains, and genuinely Episcopalian, Episcopal chaplains, and genuinely evangelical, evangelical chaplains without the government imposing itself upon free exercise there. But that's going to mean a church that recognizes what religious liberty is and how that ought to be communicated to the next generation. There are many evangelicals who because they have seen a church that in many cases has become hyper-politicized, they have seen a church that sometimes uh, in some places believes that righteousness is defined by how loudly one is screaming at the outside culture. They want to react to that by moving as far away from it as they possibly can. And it becomes very pious and spiritual to say something along the lines of, well, let's just give up our rights. Let's not worry about religious liberty. If they're going to persecute, let them persecute. If they're going to marginalize, let them marginalize. That sounds pious and spiritual because these people are assuming that we are standing in the place of Jesus over against Pilate, that we're standing in the place of John the Baptist over against Herod. But in a democratic republic, the ultimate accountability rests with the people. The question of religious liberty is not simply whether or not we are going to be persecuted. It is whether or not we are going to be persecutors. That's why the Apostle Paul appealed to his Roman citizenship all the way up to Agrippa. Because it wasn't about merely his rights It was about understanding that the gospel only goes forward if there are free consciences to bring that gospel to. We have to communicate that to a new generation of people who understand what it means to stand up for religious liberty and demonstrating to a group of people that there are worse worse things than going to jail. I want to spend the rest of my life working and fighting to keep people out of jail for their religious convictions. But the one thing that's worse than going to jail for one's faith, as Thomas Helwes did, as John Bunyan did, as Jeremiah Moore did, as a thousand others did, the one thing worse is that, the worse than that, is a group of people who would never go to jail at all. The primary thing that the Church of Jesus Christ can do to equip a new generation to be ready to stand for religious liberty is to preach a gospel that is explicit enough and strange enough and countercultural enough that the next generation strips away the prosperity gospel that too many of us have bought into 
including the discount rate prosperity gospel of a Christianity that will make us normal and acceptable in America, of a group of people who understand and know where their allegiances lie. That's in the best interest of everybody. It is in the best interest of unbelieving people if we have a Christian church and others in America who understand there is some greater power than the state, than the market, than the culture. We do that by preaching and teaching and discipling the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we pledge allegiance where we can and where we ought, but we remember how to call Jesus, Jesus. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and speak and everything like that. Um, I'm Sarah Jo Fridley. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, it, a brief background and then my question. Um, I'm so happy to hear about your support of religious liberty of, of all. I mean, that's such an important thing. Um, on June 20th of this summer, I was in my church sanctuary worshiping here in New Orleans and a group, the Operation Save America, came to us in our sanctuary, in our private space of worship, and terrorized us verbally. I'm actually still suffering from PTSD at this time. And they were hosted by local Baptist churches, and they're continuing to come back into town. And the Southern Baptist Convention still has yet to speak out against this and what they did to us. If you really support religious liberties, why aren't you also supporting that? Uh, why aren't you speaking up against that? I guess it's my question. My question is for you as the president, please. Well, why have you been silent on this act? Well, I'm not aware of, of uh, what happened, so if you would uh, email me and send me information about that. I if you would, have I received this already. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. They came in, they verbally attacked us, they, sh they uh, showed pictures to children in the nursery that were terrifying, and I think you would not have supported um, they, I don't, religious sanctuaries, churches, people should be able to be there and be in a safe space and not be fear of Agreed. someone having sure. a gun or someone going oh, to attack absolutely. me because yeah. we're there worshiping in love. Yes, sure. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, this is what happened. What is your response? What, what's your response to me? What can I take back to my community? What can I take back to the Presbyterians across the street? What can I take back to them? Uh, please. Well, I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of this organization, but of course, I'm Everyone's opposed. aware of Operation Save America. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not, not aware, aware of Operation, 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 Operation Save America. America. You actually give money to them very often because they're Is it a pro-life organization? They're anti-choice, yes. Well, we don't give any money to them. Uh, okay, so, so as the president, do you support religious liberty for all, and are yes. speaking out against that. I'm not, I'm that? not for anyone disrupting anyone's worship service. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Moore, I have two really short questions. Um, regarding the current um, Supreme Court, how do you evaluate them regarding uh, church-state separation? And my other short question is, um, if, if one supports church-state separation, how do we justify chaplains in the military? I'll take the second question uh, first, because chaplains in the military are put there not in order to, uh, to represent the government in doing religious activities, but in able to uh, enable people in the military to freely exercise their religious convictions. Uh, which. Yes, they are, uh, which is why, which is, but there's a, there's a neutrality on the part of the government. There are chaplains of, uh, of various religious uh, stripes, and their religious duties are not dictated by the government. They're dictated by their, their sponsoring uh, entities, their churches, their synagogues, their, uh, their other uh, organizations. When it comes to the Supreme Court right now, uh, the, the Hobby Lobby decision, of course, was the, the biggest uh, church-state religious liberty uh, decision that we've had uh, in a long time. There were other cases as well. Uh, that uh, Dr. Staver uh, could speak to as well. Uh, for instance, Greece versus Galloway uh, when it comes to uh, whether or not the government should be able to uh, mandate a non-sectarian prayer uh, before a town council meeting. 
I was uh, greatly relieved uh, by both of those uh, decisions, uh, but I have um, a little bit of a, of a check in saying that because it is disheartening to me that we would even have to go to the court uh, in order to say that uh, the government shouldn't be able to pave over people's consciences in forcing them to provide drugs that they believe uh, cause abortions. I, I think that that is in and of itself a grievous thing, that we have to get to that point, and also because this was a five to four decision. Uh, I'm glad uh, that this decision came out the way that it did. I'm glad Greece versus Galloway uh, came out, out the way that it did. I'm glad that Hosanna Tabor, a decision about whether or not uh, churches and religious organizations uh, have the right to employ people on the basis of their confessional uh, standards who are serving and teaching uh, ministries. I'm glad that came out with a 9-0 to, to zero, uh, ruling. But I think we see that we have a very tenuous uh, situation in American life. And the very fact that we have, uh, that we have the sort of uh, culture war debate over issues that previously, just a few years ago, were non-controversial uh, is, I think, a, a very troubling sign in American life. Someone else? My question is for uh, Dr. Swain. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what, has the, what have the effects been on those uh, organizations, those Christian organizations that actually did not um, compromise, did not sign, or they told to sign, and, and how that affected um, the, the the students, uh, particularly the one that you were invited to work. Well, at Vanderbilt, we started. Uh, I mean, there was an organization. There's a website, Restore Religious Liberty at Vanderbilt. And a lot of students were involved in the activism. They took risks. They gave media interviews. Um, most of those students have graduated. There's still uh, there's some that are seniors now. I think that they have lost a lot of confidence as individuals. And what I hear about some of the organizations is that the size, the the sizes are not as large as they were before. Uh, the, the students feel very hampered. The Christian Legal Society, they recently gave an interview to the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it's more difficult to minister, but they don't feel that they have uh, lost, you know, significant membership. But what did happen, and um, about a year ago, some students ran to be leaders of the Christian Legal Society, so maybe four or five people were elected as leaders in April in by the end of May or June, they announced that they wanted to set up the Christian Legal Fellowship. The Christian Legal Society leaders decided that they wanted to set up a new organization that would abide by the university's rules. And so what happened was we had to scramble, go back to the uh, Christian Legal Society uh, membership and get new leaders. And so there are two Christian organizations at the law school, one that follows the university's guidelines. It can openly advertise. You know, it is doing very well, I believe. And the Christian Legal Society, that is a much older organization that has national chapters, you know, alumni, that organization is very much constrained in what they can do. And so I think that um, some of the organizations like InterVarsity, they're going to operate within the guidelines. They're going to find new strategies, I believe. And when you think about it, you know, organizations are great. They provide an infrastructure, but you really don't need it to do a Christ ministry. And so I think that it's just going to force us to become more creative. But I do think there's a possibility for some religious freedom to, re to be restored at Vanderbilt. And what they did was punish all the Christian groups because of an allegation against one fraternity. And so you think about it, that everyone got punished because of one fraternity. The university claims it's anti-discrimination, yet it's done nothing about the Greek organizations. And two-thirds of the members of the Board of Trust belong to a country club that's been cited for invidious discrimination against women and uh, blacks. And so, so much for anti-discrimination. <laughs> If these uh, schools that have these policies really 
objectively enforce them, there would be no clubs on campus. There would be no sororities and no fraternities because they're not singling out sexual orientation. They have it as part of a list of non-discriminatory categories, which would mean that the, the black student club couldn't have a, a black a president. The uh, women's club couldn't have a woman for president. The La Raza club couldn't have a Hispanic uh, leading that club. The sororities couldn't have, you know, they, they couldn't be segregated between men and women. So at the end of the day, if they really start to apply these objectively, which they don't do, it would eliminate any kind of clubs or sororities or fraternities on campus. But they're not doing that. They're only doing it against the Christian organizations. Dr. Moore. Is, is there an issue out there in America, in our culture, where you wish the church would rally and go there because there's great opportunity for the gospel? I mean, is there something we're missing in, in the exchange with the culture that just has popped up in your in your ministry? Well, I think there are, I think there are many issues uh, that we're missing because... Uh, because I think that we are taking a largely reactive uh, posture toward uh, the culture, which means we don't, uh, first of all, understand long-term what's happening, uh, which is one of the reasons why evangelicals particularly tend to be caught flat-footed uh, by whatever's happening in the culture. We, we weren't ready for Roe versus Wade. Uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't see that taking place. And we didn't have the sort of theology of children and the sort of theology of the powerless uh, that we should have had to equip us to be able to deal with Roe versus Wade. And so I think that one of the primary things that we need in our congregations is for congregations that don't simply proclaim what we believe, but congregations that embody what we believe. And so we are signaling to the outside world what the kingdom of God is like. It is a lamentable shame that our congregations are neatly segregated according to ethnic categories and according to socioeconomic categories. What would it mean if we were signaling to the outside world what we believe, that the church is a colony of the gathering of every tribe, tongue, nation, and language before the throne of God, Revelation chapter 5, if our congregations included people who were from every ethnic category and from every socioeconomic uh, place uh, in our society who are worshiping together. What would it mean in terms of our pro-life witness if we not only welcomed, as we do, uh, those who are deemed to be weak and powerless in the outside world, but what would it mean if we consciously saw to it that that Down syndrome young man stands up and reads scripture and leads in prayer in our congregations, not as an act of charity toward him, but because we believe that he is a future king of the universe as a joint heir with Christ. I think that if our congregations start to do that, if we start to see the hotel maid who can barely speak English and can barely pay her rent, who is Titus II discipling the woman who is a corporate CEO because the maid is of greater spiritual maturity than the CEO, then we will be signaling to the outside world exactly what James II teaches, which is, do you not know that God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? That is the primary thing that I think we're missing uh, in our congregations right now. And until that starts to happen, the issue is not just what we're signaling to the outside culture. It is that we are shaping and forming consciences of the next generation as to what is important, what matters, and who matters. And that, I think, has to start within congregations asking what are the things that we are not seeing and we are not paying attention to right now because they simply seem so normal to us. Amen. I'd like to give my two cents on this. And it has to do, I'm a political scientist and I gave a little bit about my conversion experience. I feel called to speak to the we, the people, 
mentioned in the preamble of the Constitution because under our system of government, we select the leaders. They enact the programs and policies on our behalf. And when you look at America, more than 70% of the people profess to be Christians. And so there's some type of disconnect going on. And I think that if people would read the Constitution and begin to take responsibility for what they see, you look at President Obama, he was elected and reelected by we, the people. And I think that if we go back to our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, read the Ten Commandments, uh, go back to those biblical roots, we would be able to, to, I believe we'd be able to turn the country around and begin to cause other people to see that this country, it's different, it has something to offer, there's a reason why people risk their lives to come here, and I think that we are destroying, or a land to be destroyed, everything that's great about this nation, and when it comes, uh, you know, to um, the body of Christ, I feel like, I mean, there's so much potential, and the congregations being segregated, you know, that doesn't bother me. I don't see that necessarily as racism. I see that a lot of it has to do with we really do have different preferences when it comes to music, when it comes to how long you stay in church, when it comes to um, just how we worship. And I think that um, there are enough of us, you know, that are comfortable in different types of setting that the, the diversity you see in congregations means that people can go to the congregations where they feel most comfortable. And so, you know, maybe churches need to mix it up more, but I just think that there's a lot of potential. There's a lot that we can accomplish together and it really goes back to we the people and this nation, what it was founded for, and what we can do, you know, to be that shining light. And so I know this sounds like very cliche but I really do believe it. For all it's worth. Uh, if next summer the Supreme Court strikes down uh, the laws regarding uh, same-sex marriage or making it legal, uh, what will be the direct impact on local churches um, who, who will refuse to perform same-sex marriages and ministers who, who do that as well? And how can we, whatever those direct effects will be, how we can uh, navigate that during those? I think it's a zero-sum game. You're not going to navigate it. Um, that is going to be a cultural clash that the church is going to have to address, and you're either going to compromise your Christian convictions or there's going to be a clash like there was during the Civil Rights Movement. It's one of the two. You're not going to navigate it. You're not going to coexist with it. It's not because Christians are not tolerant in that respect, but it's because this ultimately will be a uh, very aggressive uh, pushback to anybody who doesn't agree or affirm. Take, for example, uh, this, is, this is a minor situation, maybe major for churches, but in the scheme of the culture, it's minor. Uh, Bob Jones University had a policy at one time regarding uh, forbidding interracial dating, and uh, that was part of their religious conviction. They have abandoned that since then, they no longer believe that that position was scriptural, but they had it at one time. There was no law regarding uh, getting tax-exempt status that you had to um, have uh, laws that were not like that or such laws would be contrary to your tax-exempt status. What there was is the federal civil rights law that has the non-discrimination categories, which will include uh, race. So the IRS came against Bob Jones, and they said, that it doesn't violate a specific law, there was no law that it violated, but it violated the public policy. And consequently, since uh, public policy in general was expressed by the non-discrimination law, we are not gonna give you tax exempt status because we're not gonna give you that when it is contrary to public policy. When this becomes the law, if it does, and it is really going to be uh, a five to four decision, 
you already have had two justices perform same-sex ceremonies, Justice Kagan and Justice Ginsburg. Uh, they're actively engaged in performing these public acts before the cases have actually been decided, even though they're currently pending at the United States Supreme Court. So you know exactly uh, what their advocacy will be on this. But when this happens, I think the first thing that'll happen, or, or one of the things that'll happen, not the first thing, is tax exemption for churches from a federal standpoint, uh, property tax exemption as well from a state and local standpoint. In fact, in New Jersey, when before they actually uh, crossed the precipice of same-sex uh, marriage or same-sex unions, they had a uh, sexual orientation non-discrimination in their state law and a Methodist association lost property tax exemption because it refused to allow its facility to be used for a same-sex ceremony. So they no longer have state property tax exemption there. So I think that'll clearly happen. Um, the question will be whether or not you'll have to have your facilities used for same-sex ceremonies if you're performing weddings. And um, I think that won't be a, an immediate impact, but I think that certainly will be uh, an impact that will come. There's no question about that. Hawaii had a law that they were going to pass, and they did not want to exempt uh, churches. They ultimately got pushback. They did exempt churches. Currently, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act has an exemption for religion. It hasn't passed yet, but it's certainly something that's high on the uh, agenda of many people in Washington, D.C. Those uh, uh, homosexual advocacy organizations that once supported ENDA now no longer support ENDA if it has a religious exemption. So the end game is ultimately absolute um, intolerance of any contrary viewpoint. So it will be a cataclysmic culture-shifting event, and I don't think there's coexistence with it. Wherever it has come in, there's not coexistence in Massachusetts regarding the adoption facilities. There's not coexistence in New Hampshire, in New Mexico regarding your wedding or your Melissa's cakes or your bed and breakfast in Vermont, or you can go on and on and on and on. Where that comes in, it is a complete cultural clash. So that is going to be a real challenge for how is the church going to react to it. It's unlike Roe versus Wade in the sense that Roe versus Wade happened, and um, people opposed it, but they weren't forced to participate or affirm it. When this happens, it's not going to be that you can just simply coexist and you can... Uh, oppose it and ideologically and religiously don't agree with it, uh, you will be forced to accept it, affirm it, participate in it. It will affect uh, things across the, the board, counselor licenses, law licenses. It will have, not necessarily immediately, there will be some things that will happen immediately, but that will be the, the, the effect of it. And, and that will be a real question as to how the church is going to, res going to respond to it. The first thing I think that uh, any of us need to do is to reclaim uh, what it means for marriage uh, to be articulated and to be officiated uh, in our own congregations. Uh, frankly, one of the most controversial things that I ever say is not anything on television, it's not anything at a panel like this, it is when I tell uh, a young man and a young woman that I'm not going to be able to officiate at their wedding ceremonies. Uh, not because I don't like them, uh, not because uh, I don't, uh, I don't uh, necessarily even think they might not uh, should be married, uh, but because I don't have the authority biblically to marry this couple. Uh, when this is an unbelieving couple, for instance, who have no accountability uh, to the congregation to be able to hold them to their vows, or when it's a believer marrying uh, an unbeliever. There is always in every community, especially in the Bible Belt, the marrying parson, who is that guy who will simply perform whatever marriage for whoever shows up uh, at his front door. That is gone, and good riddance to it, uh, because we're going to have to reclaim what it means for us to hold people accountable to their marriages, which means a biblical understanding of what marriage is and why it matters, and a reclaiming of the wedding itself. Uh, the wedding is not a celebration of the love of Chad and Tina. 
in which they are putting on a, a party for everyone that is around them. In the wedding, you have a group of people who are pledging. You have two people, a man and a woman, pledging themselves. Not a group of people yet, but maybe we'll be there soon. Uh, Two people who are pledging themselves to one another with a gathering of people who are witnesses holding them accountable to these vows. If you right now, those of you who are ministers of the gospel, are too cowardly or weak, To be able to say to a couple or to a mother or a father, I have no ability by conscience or by authority to officiate at this wedding, then you have already put your courage in a blind trust and you will not be able to navigate ministry in the years to come. So you should probably go and get job training right now. That's going to have to change immediately. All right, one last quick question. Yes, I see that hand. Radical Islam, like ISIS, poses a unique threat to religious liberty because it's a demand that people follow its religion. Um, will, it, will it become a challenge to defend the religious liberty of a group that kills people who will not follow its religion? Lord, can you repeat the question? <coughs> Who would you like to answer that? Anybody wants to do it? Uh, uh, the, the question is, in light of ISIS as a, a group that is out there demanding that everybody uh, adopt their religious viewpoint, and if you don't, they will execute you, how challenging will it be for the church to advocate for religious liberty for that group to exist when it, uh, it, the way it is practicing uh, and acting towards others? Did I summarize that correctly? Also, the very fact that there are Muslims that, you know, they don't they want to take away your bacon. They want to take away your bacon, not <laughs> their bacon. Uh, and so with Sharia law, there's a concern certainly in Nashville about whether or not Sharia law is being adopted in some parts of the country. And if it is by certain judges, how, how will it affect us if that continues? When it comes to ISIS, you have a terrorist uh, organization that is a threat to the common good. And so we have a Romans 13 responsibility to uh, deal with ISIS uh, with swiftness and with uh, severity and for, with any other uh, terrorist group. If the question is about Islam itself, I do to be able to outlaw people on the basis of what those people believe. Uh, now, this is, this is an issue that we must get right if, if we are going to give to the government the ability to zone a mosque out of existence simply because it is a mosque, then you have handed a sword that does not belong to the government to the government, and it is a sword, first of all, that is morally wrong to be used in that way, but secondly is a sword that will, in the fullness of time, be used against you. I do not want those decisions made by bureaucrats, and I do not have a gospel that is dependent upon government welfare. The gospel is big enough to fight for itself. We need a government that allows the sort of pluralism where we are able to stand and to speak with one another, and I believe the Holy Spirit is powerful enough uh, to deal with that. Well, thank you very much. Let's give a warm round of thanks to our.